Hey folks, Roland Martin here, host and managing editor of Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show. Glad to be here for the virtual conference of the CBCF ALC. Normally we're gathering together in Washington, D.C., but uh, the coronavirus has changed all of that. This is the ninth annual Hip Hop in Politics Forum put on by Congressman Andre Carson of Indiana. Of course, uh, our focus uh, is always about reaching younger generation, talking about politics, what they can do with their involvement. And so let's get this thing started with the person who brings us together every single year. And that is it. my man, Congressman Andre Carson. Roland, 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 the man himself. Thank you so much. And hello to all of you. Uh, I've been honored to hold this forum for several years now, as Roland mentioned. And this format is unlike any we've done before. I certainly wish we could all be there together in person, but I'm thankful we can all come together for this conversation, even if it's virtual. I think this year is more important than ever for the hip hop community to come together to discuss how we can use our influence and our voices for change. As we head into the 2020 election, we know what's at stake. Do we want four more years of incompetence in the face of a deadly pandemic? And do we want four more years of willful discard and disdain of a movement to make sure that Black lives really matter? And lastly, how do we leverage our voting block, our influence, our money, our economic genius to bring about change on the incoming or existing administration? Thank you, Roland. All right, Congressman, certainly appreciate it. Let's go ahead and get this thing started, introducing our panel. First up, uh, he is a passionate community organizer whose unique life experiences have helped him become a powerful force in the fight for police reform. We certainly welcome Andre Taylor to our panel today. David Dash, he's an artist and a mogul who has been in the hip hop game for many years and is using his multimedia platform to educate and inspire. And of course, uh, my home girl, you see her on CNN, you hear her on The Breakfast Club. She's a former Capitol Hill uh, a staffer, also who was once the executive director of the Congressional Black Caucus. Welcome, Angela Rye, and we'll later be joined by my good buddy, Tamika Mallory. She is, of course, a fierce and tireless activist who helped uh, uh, lead uh, the original uh, co-organizer of the Women's March, and she now, of course, is with her group, Until Freedom. Glad to have all of you here. I wanna get this thing started off with you, Angela. When we look at the numbers, numbers don't lie, and that is the most difficult group to get engaged in voting is the 18 to 24 demographic. As you go up, the numbers increase all the way up to older voters as well. And, and I was on social media the other day and we were talking about this whole deal. And, and I said to folks, folks said, well, they're waiting for somebody to uh, activate or lead, have policies that lead to change. I then said, well, if you don't vote for those very people, they will never get elected. So therefore, you're waiting on the very people who you say aren't actually getting, uh, aren't actually creating the kind of change. How do we communicate to the 1824 demographic that their vote does indeed matter and why they must be fully engaged in the political process? It's a great question, Roland. I would say first, you know, this conversation is about hip hop and politics. And I think hip hop is a little over 50 years old now. Yep. So part of that conversation um, doesn't really apply to now. It is a very stable, reliable voting base as it relates to younger folks. Um, maybe we'll call them the mumble rap generation. Um, I think that it's a lot more challenging. And part of it is if you've never seen yourself reflected in a system, what inspires you to go and be a part of that system? And so that is a very difficult question. I think that black folks for generations have been wrestling with, frankly, since um, the arrival of the first slave ship. You know, we've been a part of building every single institution in this country and yet treated as invisible and yet treated as if our voices don't matter. And yet even written in the constitution noted as three fifths. So how do you change that? It is a very cyclical problem that you mentioned. And part of it is about um, embracing collective power to the point where it shifts not only the narrative, not only the story, but actually results into real action. Um, so I don't know. I think that so much of it is uh, young people are the folks who will take it to the streets, are bold in their ideas of change, are bold in what they think policy should look like. Um, there are a number of members of Congress, um, including who I call Dre Day, but Congressman Carson sitting here who 
listens to young people. And I think part of it is we're always talking about what we need to be telling young people, but maybe, maybe if our tact was, um, tactic was to hear them, to hear their concerns, to hear what they deem is the most appropriate next action, maybe that's how we ensure that they remain involved. It's really hard to be involved in a system that treats you as invisible and like your voice doesn't matter. Um, Andre, I mean, we, we, when we look at, obviously, uh, the critical issues, when we, when we start breaking these things down, conversations that I've had, I, I go back to 2016. There was a young sister. Uh, she was in her early 20s, and she called my radio show, and she said, you know what, I, I'm just going to ignore the presidential race uh, because I'm not satisfied with Trump or Clinton. I'm just going to work on issues in my state. And she was in North Carolina. And I said, okay, tell me your top five issues. And she told me, and I said, you do realize that the president has a direct impact on all five of those issues. And then we begin to talk about these things. Uh, she, all of a sudden, she goes, wait a minute, hold up, I, I had no idea. And I think that's one of the things there, the fact that I was engaging her, but I think well, one of the things that we have to do, anybody who's older, you have to connect the dots to begin to get folks to understand that you might be fighting for change in the streets, but the change you're fighting for is only can happen if it's done by policymakers. So those two go together. So let's talk about prioritizing and let's talk about what really these kids 18 to 24 are going through in their environment and how they prioritize what's important to them. If you're trying to get something to eat and you're hungry and you've been in a household where your mama and your grandmama and your great grandmother has been poor, there's this idea that we need to come up at all costs, right? And some of that leads to some of the activities we see that are going on in the streets. So now when you talk to one of these youngsters, especially within the hip hop culture, they're, they haven't prioritized why that is important in their lives. Because no matter who's been in power, Democrat or Republican, they've never seen anything affect them in their lives where they should care. So the conversation has to start with first, how do we sustain the minds of kids that are in those crucial situations and then make them understand that they need to prioritize that they could have a likely change. But that's a hard conversation when somebody's hungry. It's a hard conversation when somebody's been impoverished. It's a hard conversation when you're seeing everybody around you succeeding on TV and videos and the like for you to sit and say, I'm gonna go vote. They talk about, I'm gonna go grind, right? So if you're not in the streets, and me, I come from the streets. People know me uh, over 20 years ago as Gorgeous Dre in the movie American Pimp, the Hughes brothers came to me and I was a technical advisor of that film. Well, I have a different conversation with youngsters because they know I come from where they come from, right? And so them, being able to see me transition in my life into what I've been able to do in politics, the only organization that have actually had policy change, leading Washington State and becoming the first state with the police accountability law with Initiative 940 that started with my organization, not this time, when my brother was killed in 2016 by police out here. Them being able to see me coming from where they're at, right? and to be able to transition in my life to do what I'm doing and to do what I've done, then that becomes a different conversation, right? Because when we were out there trying to get people to vote for the initiative, black people and generally that population, that age, that demographic was saying, man, ain't nothing gonna change. But when okay, they- Okay, so how do you get to them? How, how do you speak to them? I mean- You gotta what, show them what change. What are you saying? You gotta show them change. If you just talking, and they're seeing change with, with sports, and they're seeing change with hustling, and when they're seeing change with rapping, that's what's gonna appeal to them. So you coming over telling them to vote, they like, boy, please, vote. Boy, I'm out here trying to get mine. So there's a different mentality. So when I talk to them, it's a different story because I can show them change from my life. They need to see individuals that come from where they come from with credibility that can speak into their lives and say, voting works. Look what we did with Initiative 940. Voting works. But if you can't point to nothing specifically, right, right. they're not going to hear you, Roland. D D Dame, I want to bring you in on this. Uh, I, I think back to 
Ferguson, Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. Uh, was talking to some young brothers in, uh, on the streets of Ferguson, and they said, man, man, we don't want to hear none of that. And Reverend Jackson said, he said, let me, let me ask y'all a question. Do y'all want to see the officer who shot and killed Michael Brown? Do you want to see him indicted? They said, yes. And he said, do you, do you want to see him uh, convicted? They said, yes. Reverend Jackson said, you do, he said, they, he said would, you like to, would you love to be on that jury uh, to hear the case? They said, yes. He said, you do know that you can't even serve on the jury unless you're registered to vote. They said, no, we didn't know that. He said, you won't even get called. That's where I, again, where I go to connecting the dots. I think for a lot of us, we assume everybody knows. When in fact, a lot of people, people simply don't know, we have to be constantly in this sort of voter education, civics, training, teaching, and this is not just 1824, this is folks uh, 35, 49, 54. A lot of people simply, they just don't know. So here's my issue. You know, I went to school and when I was young, I wasn't taught anything about really what politics was. No understanding of it. And when I was given anything about politics, it was in a language I didn't understand. It was in an unapproachable language. You know, I love the Black Caucus and I go, I've been invited by uh, the, the Senator, I mean, the Congressman, I'm sorry. Um, and I, I, I've been able to really look at, people really care, but I do believe that the language that the Black Caucus at this moment is speaking is not relatable to a younger uh, generation. Uh, like Andre said, if you're not talking about getting no money and you don't have any food that's really all you're worried about is getting money. And the way we're programmed is to always be in the position of defense. We're programmed to always think that we can't change anything unless we do it ourselves. And I think it's very strategic that within the educational system, we aren't taught how to lobby or pass a law or how to engage or how to make change. But we are taught how to play basketball. We are taught how to be distracted and devote all of our time into thinking that our only escape from a social class is entertainment. That's what we're programmed to think. That's what school teaches us. Or you have no other option but to listen to the local plug, the person that's getting the most money on the block. And that's it. There's no other language that a child's going to be able to understand other than either respect for someone else's drama or trauma that got them to a better place but they gotta have that trauma for people to respect it. Or like, why can't we get there without the trauma? But also we have to be able to recognize the trauma. I think the religion, the way that we're always taught to think that, you know, we're number two, that the proper pronunciation, I'm not gonna get into all of that because I know we can't do it. But I just think systematically we're programmed not to engage and we continue to put forth that pattern. And I'm a guy that's really not about doing all that talking. I'm about action. So it's about what can we do for ourselves to me? Because I don't think they're going to do nothing for us. We still living by the same laws that were passed by people that had slaves. So I just think we're programmed to be slaves and not know it. And we're programmed not to fight and not to know how to fight. And that's the issue. And that is what needs to be dealt with now. They're not going to teach us how to talk to each other. We got to talk to each other. And we have to provide that economic stability or that escape so that they'll listen. Bottom line is if you broke, you're not listening to nobody but the plug. If you ain't talking about getting me some money, I don't really want to hear it. Uh, anybody could jump in and answer this. Uh, and if we we're talking about communication, if we're talking about uh, what we have to create, uh, you know, look, we understand our communication mechanisms. Look, I I'm in media. I've been doing media since I was 14 years old. Uh, and, and the reality is that if you look at what's happening on black radio, uh, you have, uh, you, you barely have any news going on. So, and you barely have any talk shows. So you really don't have uh, that particular outlet that where you're driving information. You hear the phrase information is power. Then when you look they're at- gonna, They're not gonna give us the information. No, 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 that's, no, no that's, that's my whole point. That's so so my point is- that's why I started television network. So I can drive the patterns and make it cool to be aware and also teach you how to make a difference instead of talking. It's a lot more than just voting. You know, you gotta right. be able to vote, but you gotta be able to get a law passed. Period. And, and that's what and that's what I'm saying. What let's talk now. I want us to talk about those communication mediums. Um, where where should we be sending people 
uh, to be able to to be fed because the reality is that if a home where they go to escape movies, music, work, and sports, everything that we're programmed to distract us, the same exact outlet they've been using to distract us is the same exact outlets we have to use to um, focus to Can control the narrative. Yeah. Aim Dash Networks, Roland Martin Unfiltered. That's where you go. Angela Rise, IG, Andre's IG. That's where we send them. But you well, gotta I make the cool. podcast too. But I was I was gonna say um, that what I, what I just heard you say, Dame, is super important. It's about where we go for distraction. Maybe that's how they intended to program us. But I also want to give a little bit of credence and pay homage to. Um, the creators and the creatives and the people who have used those same platforms that were designed to distract to empower us instead, right? So there are lyricists who use their, you know, their bars, right, to, to educate us, to teach us, and to call us to action. And that has been the case since the, you know, the beginning of hip hop, since the birth of hip hop, that has been the case. And I also think it's important for us to understand that there are athletes like Muhammad Ali, like Cap, like all of the other ones who you don't hear about who use those platforms to also teach us about the importance and of black power. power. But not to cut you off, all those platforms yeah. are other people's platforms. That's the problem. Okay, you well, and so- So much, but for so long, the bottom line is the narrative is this. That's great. They let you in the house so you can act a certain way in the house. My thing is build your own house and we act the way we want to act. And I'm not taking any credence away from anything that's been done. I'm just saying certain things have to change. My point is we can't expect them to help us. Okay. We got to help I, 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 I wasn't talking about that. I'm going to go back to Angela. I'm, hold, one second. The one narrative second. has to be that it's ours. One second. One second, Dane. I'm going to go back to Angela. This and, and Angela, to your point, to your point, uh, take LeBron James. To, to your point, Angela, LeBron yeah. James said that he normally gets off of social media during the playoffs. Mm -hmm. This year, he said, it's not going to happen. Just the other day, yeah. uh, he sent out a tweet where he said, to every NBA fan ready to watch playoffs, please take a minute to read this letter and consider our call to action. Black, brown, white, this fight is real, and you can't sit on the sidelines. And it was a piece from, uh, from the undefeated. To mm -hmm. your point, there are athletes like LeBron and others. There are artists, uh, many artists, who are using those spaces to drive the messaging saying, since you're coming here, I'm gonna put this that's out right. while you're here. Go, Angela, go ahead. No, and, and, and I think that's exactly that's exactly right. Um, and Andre, I don't wanna talk over you, but I just wanna kind of hone in I'm, on- I'm gonna go to Angela, then Andre, then to Dane. Angela, go ahead. Okay, so my point is this. I was not, at the time, making a point about black ownership. Um, I was raised by a, a father, an activist who, like I've drilled into me is black ownership. Asked and answered, agreed, right? That's not where the challenge is. The challenge is while we're building the things that we should own um, and actually have access to uh, uh, access to capital, ensuring that we have these spaces, the people who have gone to majority owned platforms, there's, they can also own some of that. So there needs to be a whole different ALC discussion about the spectrum of ownership because you can also have equity in those spaces. I would argue that while they are in predominantly white owned spaces, they still should be using their voices responsibly to get the change that we need in all of the areas we need. So it's whether we're talking political, he's coming to you third, you got it. He, um, whether we're talking about political needs and demands and laws that need to be passed, you're talking about the dude on the block that wants to know how to get money. How do you get money if the policies aren't allow, allowing you to get money? So it is a very simple no policy. That's hold, hold on, hold on, so Dame, 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 one second, one second. Hold on, wait, 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 one second, one second, one second. Dame, 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 hold on, Dame, Dame, one second. One second. And Angela, finish your point, then I'm going to Andre. Angela, finish your point. The point is finished, right? Like I said what I said, the bottom line is there's a spectrum of ownership that we need to be in those majority white owned spaces. Like, how are we gonna say, oh, we're gonna just do everything ourselves. We're not gonna, we still need to be um, places where black people spend their money. We have $1.3 trillion in buying power. Dang, this is not school. I don't understand what's happening right oh, now. Oh, 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 oh. Dang, dang, dang. Like, dang. Like oh, one this second, one talking. second, like, one second, one second, one second, one second, one second, one second, dang, 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 I got you. Dang, dang, I got it, trust me, I'm gonna come to you. 
I'm uh, so Angela, finish your point, and then I'm going to Andre. Then I'm coming to Dame. Trust me, I, am, I got it, y'all. I am okay. I'm yielding the floor to Andre. So Andre, this this communication piece. I keep going back to this, uh, but we really it, it has to have capacity, and that is we have to be. It has to be so much broader, uh, and so. Uh, speak to, to your from your vantage point. Uh, how do you see us doing that in terms of really driving this information and and speaking to not just eighteen twenty four year olds but others uh, who have checked out of this process? So, <clears throat> Angela, you weren't speaking over me earlier. I was telling you to can finish your point. Is what I was saying. Yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> let me talk about this. My father used to say something to me. He used to say, Andre, don't talk me to death. He said, the worst death in the world is being talked to death. Um, what I understand is that black folks are stuck in a particular area, from my opinion. They're stuck on this idea when we hear wonderful orators and they'll speak and we get very, very excited about that. And we think <coughs> that <clears throat> that means a lot. <clears throat> that has developed a lot of talk heads on social media that have been very distractive and destructive to us because there's a world of convolution in urban, in the urban community. Come on, come on. So, so let me say this. <clears throat> I have challenged those individuals and said that the motto of my organization, not this time, is do the work. The reason why this is important is because our people have been talked to, lied to, deceived with words for so long, especially if you come in into the hood talking about something, you're not about to, they about to shut you down. So do the work is the only way that I know to communicate if I love my people. Matter of fact, I'm gonna do the work and I'm gonna sh give something to you because, I press, because you're precious to me so that something you can see tangible that is not deceptive and that you could see and hold for yourself. So when my brother was killed in 2016 by the Seattle Police Department, I was thinking about how I was gonna deal with this situation that I'm going somewhere, Roland. And I had saw that we have been losing this narrative fight for decades because when there's an incident that happened, that there's a reaction, right? And we lose the narrative because the reactions could be negative. We could burn up some stuff and whatever. And the media focuses on that and not the, and not the original shooting of the police officer. So when I came back to Seattle, I sat down with the chief of police at the time, Captain O'Toole. And you know what I told her? Because I said, I'm not gonna be reactive. I'm gonna be responsive. I told her, I know I can't bring my little brother back, but I'm still willing to work with you so that we can reduce the incidence of the violence in the community. She wasn't prepared for my response. I used that narrative in Washington state, dealt with the most powerful people and submitted this state, submitted law enforcement in this state. And today, my organization leading Washington state in becoming the first and only state with a police accountability law through black genius and how I operated with the system, not urban. The things that we did was on system levels, right? It wasn't an urban level. And I could say today across this country that in order for us to get real change, I got law change, right? Done it. I'm not guessing my way through this. I know exactly what I'm doing, right? And so I, I go all over to try to give the blueprint to our people on how we did it here in a state that's 3.5% black people, in a state that majority white. And all I'm saying is that all this talking, I don't do too much of that talking. I'm honored to be on here with Dre because Dre was gonna be, you know, come down to another thing that I created called Conversations with the Streets. But I'm yeah. about doing that work like Dane said. And I'm not just talking about it, I have the evidence. So when I'm talking to young folks in the street, they communicate to the evidence. They respond to the evidence is what I'm saying. And if you're not producing any evidence, real hardcore fact where they could tangibly touch it and see that it's real and true, we're not gonna get a response. Okay, that so means, and this is the last thing I'm gonna say in, for a while, that we have to go to work providing <laughs> evidence. That's what that means. I'm going to go to Dame here because Dame, uh, on, on that particular point, um, and, and the reason I keep coming back to messaging, look, you've been highly successful in a medium that knows how to move the needle. 
that knows how that that where someone can talk about a product that nobody knows about and all of a sudden sales skyrocket that can that can mention something and then next thing you know a thing is taking off so how how would you apply what you have learned and experienced being successful in hip hop what would you say to folks who are in politics in terms of what that blueprint is to be able to communicate to move the needle? Well, the first thing I say is I've been more successful in fashion outside of hip hop, but that hip hop was my base. I've been successful in making movies. I've been, I'm not just successful for a hip hop guy. I'm successful for a human being. And- Right, so, so what I mean is all that collectively, all that collectively, what is your, how would you take your knowledge base? I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you. So again, I noticed that patterns are what make people do things, they get hypnotized, patterns. And I know that whoever controls media, controls information, that's who controls the world. So the narrative is very important. Number one, I'm not about this fitting in and you know, in somebody's house and expecting them to treat me well. I just don't expect it. I don't expect my oppressor to give me anything ever. I expect them to trick me all the time. I don't expect them to dictate anything that I'm doing. So I started my own television network 10 years ago. And I make sure instead of us fighting each other, I fight them. I call out their names. I don't fight another black man. I publicly fight another culture that's oppressing me. I call them out by name, and then I put them out of business. The only way to fight racism is economic empowerment. If someone will not hire you, you buy their business and you fire them. And the way you have to do this is teach the children that they have confidence, who they are, what they can do, and not get into this pattern of being told what to do, told what to eat and told everything and trying to fit in. That's just the narrative that has to stop. Anyone that pays me controls me, period. I wanna pay me. And that's the pride we have to have. It's a narrative of pride and also tangibles. So when you say, what are you gonna do? What I've been doing. I've been making our heroes famous on my platform. Uh, the, 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 the Congressman is on my platform every second I want him to, everybody that's fighting for us needs to be famous. They need to be economically empowered. They need to, you can't teach somebody how to get money if you ain't got it. So we have to make our heroes wealthy so that they can make other people wealthy once they have those platforms. And for these children, you have to talk to them and you have to make it a pattern from the beginning. But they don't do that in education that cause we're given the education, the same education the same curriculum basically that slave owners gave us 50 to 100 years ago. Nothing's changed. Nothing that I learned in school helped me be an entrepreneur other than reading and math and me saying, I'm not listening to you principal because my car's better than yours. Why would I listen to you? I got more money than you, I'm younger than you. That's the language that a child that's oppressed speaks. And also we have to address that unrecognized trauma. No one talks about a kid that got to see a, 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 a younger child get shot in the head, then he just goes to school like nothing happened. I used to go to funerals like they were parties and I didn't think it bothered me, but it did. So the trauma has to be recognized. The education has to be recognized. The people we worship have to be our color, not theirs. And yeah, the narrative is, yo, I don't wanna play for your football league. I make my own. That has to be the narrative. That's the fight. I ain't gonna break nothing but a record for how much money I get. That's it. I'm not internalizing racism. I swing, but I swing economically. And I think that's the power and the passion and the narrative that has to be instilled in us. Not to just talk about it, to do it immediately. And whoever's cool has to make that the cool thing to do. Angela. You got, you got that fashion involved. You gotta look good. Like if you telling somebody to vote and you're not dressed better than them, they not listening to you. Angela, Angela, I interviewed Reverend Dr. James Lawson. A lot, of, a lot of people nationally got their first real taste of him when he spoke at the funeral of Congressman John Lewis. I, I, I say arguably 
he gave the absolute best eulogy at the particular funeral. And one of the things that I, when my interview with him, the people can go to my YouTube channel and watch, is that he, he said when they decided to do the Nashville movie, they spent three months just discussing why they were doing it. Then he said the next three months, they talked about what they were going to do. They literally spent six months of just discussing that and really developing this to really understand what they, what they were doing. I think the point that you made earlier is, is so critical, is, and that is, it doesn't matter. It, you may not be in a position today to be able to own your own. For me, I spent six years at CNN. But the audience that I cultivated at CNN, yeah. I was teaching while I was there. I was inspiring while I was there. And then when I go to TV One, then I leave TV One, I launch my own platform. Those audiences followed, but I used the medium for the same purpose while I was there. And so how are you? How are you speaking to, what would you say uh, to someone uh, who is, whether they're in mainstream operation, whether they have a corporate job or whatever, what do you say to them how they should be communicating with their peers on this very issue of politics and policy and 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 how these things matter not just in dc but uh, how do we get that stop sign or that speed bump and how do we get new sewer systems and how do we get parts and look the whole issue of even just uh, the census of uh, filling that out and so what's the messaging what do you what what do you want what are you telling others we should be saying to other people yeah. Well, first, um, I want to say that there are several different means to the same end goal, and all of that is okay. Um, I would say, second, that politics impacts our lives, whether we engage with it or not, and so we might as well ensure that our voices are heard. There is not a single um, billionaire um, in this country. There's not a single very successful business owner in this country who does not have some type of regular political engagement on the local, state, and federal level because those entities regulate those businesses. Um, I would also say um, from a cultural standpoint that it is important um, for us to understand the foundation upon which this country was built. And if we are going to address trauma, if we are going to address systemic oppression and institutional racism, we also have to address misogyny. Um, that is a very important thing for us to do. And that means that um, when, when the family enters the room, we have an equal opportunity to address issues, to respectfully disagree, um, and to engage and figure out what the path forward is. Because right now we know the path that we've been on is not serving us. And so that means from a political standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from a social construct standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, and from a spiritual standpoint, we've got some work to do as a people. All of that will help further advance our ownership goals, but it all must advance our political goals, again, which shape our ability to be successful owners under the current construct of this really jacked up system in this country. You know, Andre, when you were talking about speaking to young people in terms of in their language and what they understand, I, I, I thought about uh, Barbara Ransby's book uh, on Ella Baker. Ella Baker, she told uh, SNCC students, when you go to these sharecroppers, they may not have your college education, but they're smart. She said, take your college clothes off and put your overalls on and go to them and ask them, what is it that you want to achieve and how I'm here to help you? Uh, she also differed with Dr. King where she, Ella Baker believed that it was pulpit, it was pew to pulpit and not pulpit to pew. And so, and so, and so with that in mind, in terms of being able to, uh, to reach, do you believe that what we need what African Americans need is to go back to what we had in the 50s and 60s, where we literally, literally have citizenship education training, where we have freedom schools, where we literally are having mass training. Because what I get from so many people every day who email me, even my show, man, I had no idea what you're talking about. I had no idea that that impacted that. I had no idea. We, we were just a lot of folks who are walking around who simply don't know. Yeah. So let me say, uh, I, I love some of these writers. Emerson said, a foreigner's genius is a savior to count cannibalism. Love that line. A foreigner's genius 
is a savior to cannibalism. I love the line. Um, one thing that what empowers our people is understanding when I speak, I've lectured at universities, spoken at prisons, taught at treatment centers and the like. But what I teach them is that, that this country, the backbone of this country is its universities. And its universities are structured to empower white people, right? They're not structured to create genius out of the mud. They're mm -hmm. limited in that. That's our culture. Our culture is able to create genius out of the mud. We've done it over and over again. Malcolm X was a pimp and a hustler. I mean, just the story goes on about what our culture has been able to create, but we don't see it. We see our culture as less than. We don't see the specific things that only we are privy to and only we have the capacity to do, to birth genius, right? So let me say this also. You must remember, I heard Angela say something what this country was built on or whatever, but let me go a little further than that. Understand that America is like any other empire that has existed before it, conquering lands and people. That's what empires do, conquer lands and people. Now, we as a conquered people, along with maybe 75% of the world that Europeans have conquered, there is an idea within the status quo of white men that are on top of this country that to the victor goes the spoils. So we can't go before a conqueror begging and asking because the conqueror only respects power. So just, I don't want to belabor the point, but the fact that I didn't come begging, but we built power with 23 organizations, forced law enforcement to come to the table, forced the governor and everybody on down from the mayor, the police chief and the sheriff, forced them to comply with what we were doing because we built power. So in order for us to have a community again, right? We have to learn how to build power, which is not something common that we talk about in our community. You talked about building, building power. You talked about building power and bringing Congressman Andre Carson there because Congressman, I, I, I cannot tell you, Angela probably can speak to this as well. There is nothing I hear more than people who say, CBC ain't done nothing. They out. They they just there. They don't stand up. They ain't fighting for nothing. Uh, we don't hear about what they're doing. Why aren't they passing bills? All of those different things. And and, and, I, and look, I, I've tried my best, Congressman, uh, to explain that to people. I, I do. I want you to speak to that. But also, I think this is where CBCF and CBCI. So the CBC Foundation, the CBC Institute should be leading these nationwide train citizenship education sessions on this very thing we're talking about. Because if they don't, who will? Congressman, go ahead. Well, uh, uh, with respect to the, to, to the various arms, we have the CBCI, the CBC Foundation, the CBC PAC, of which I sit on the board. The CBC I, the Institute, has a political boot camp. As you know, uh, Roland, we send uh, constituents every year to this political boot camp. And what it teaches is what are politics? What does politics mean? What does it mean to be a campaign manager? What does it mean to be a candidate? What does it mean to be a donor? How do you leverage your voting block to yield change from a city councilor, a member of Congress, a mayor, a governor, a president of the United States? I think we'll have gone of the days where a president, a presidential candidate or a gubernatorial candidate or a congressional candidate can show up to our churches, our mosques, our schools. We get a photo op, they do the electric slide, they vote, they get voted into office. And once they're in office, they vote against you and my interests. With respect to the Congressional Black Caucus, the Congressional Black Caucus is not necessarily a civil rights organization, as you know. We're a group of legislators from across the country, oftentimes with different political views, different philosophical views, different regional perspectives. 
but we represent a huge voting block. So when the Affordable Care Act was introduced and fought for, the Obama administration had to come to the Black Caucus and help negotiate this piece of legislation, though imperfect, but it was powerful, with the Congressional Black Caucus, because if the Congressional Black Caucus chose to sit on its hands, we could have stopped that bill from getting passed. When you look at financial regulatory reform, when Congress bailed out the banks, it was the Congressional Black Caucus that pushed to make sure that every agency under the financial services umbrella had an office of women and minority affairs. If you look at, if, with respect to what Brother Puff is doing, it was the Congressional Black Caucus and the Financial Services 10, of which I'm one of them, who pressed Comcast and the others to offer these deals to these minority institutions and companies. That's why Puff was able to get revoked. And so the Congressional Black Caucus is more than just a group of legislators. We are an active body for decades who have put pressure on corporate entities and have put pressure on state and local municipalities to do the right thing. Are we perfect? No. Are we ever evolving? Absolutely. But I would say to them, if you want to be engaged, put pressure on your locally elected officials to see the benefit. And don't sleep on the Black Caucus. We have a lot more work to do. And the three arms of the Black Caucus uh, reflect those interests each and every day. Can Can point? Point? Hold, 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 one second, one second, one second, one second, one second. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. To that point, I just want to add this point because somebody watching may say, well, I don't know how all that affects young people. I just want to give people one example. When the farm bill was passed, somebody might be watching going, Roland, really? You talking to black people in the farm bill? Yes. Congresswoman Alma Adams made sure that something was inserted into that farm bill to ensure that dollars went to HBCUs that are land grant universities, North Carolina A&T, Florida A&M, Prairie View A&M University. And so when a person is, when a person is going farm bill and black caucus, how's that help black people? That's one of the ways, although name not on the bill, it was inserted into the bill. But again, this is where I still believe, and I, I'll say it again. You mentioned the CBC Institute. They have these political boot camps where they send people. I believe what should be happening is that we should be, there should be weekly or twice a month community citizenship education training sessions where we are teaching people this constantly and it's not just, you know, every now and then. And so that to me is how I also believe we should be impacting this. Angela Dane. So um, I think it's important to note too, um, Andre said that, you know, the CBC, you can say what you want and all that, but I think it's so important to recall that the CBC is also known as the conscience of the Congress because when Congress tries to go a step too far and treat Black people like they don't matter, the CBC is there to ensure legislative language for our protection and our ultimate prosperity and power. I think a lot of that um, isn't discussed because the CBC is used to doing the work without the recognition. The problem is if there's no recognition, then people don't know what the work is. And then of course, at some point, start questioning its relevance. Um, I think the members have come miles on that. Um, I, even since Andre's been serving, um, you know, there's been a revolutionary shift in the amount of, um, and the number of ways that the CBC has begun to tell its own story. And I think we could see some of that even with justice and policing this year, um, of course, after George Floyd was killed um, by the police and the ways in which they brought um, Breonna Taylor um, to light and, and focused on that on the House floor. Um, just on the other side of Congressman Lewis's passing, Roland, as you mentioned earlier, I think it's super important for us to always remember that um, voting isn't something that was just important to the ancestors. It's important to all of us. But most importantly, we have to give people things to vote for. What are the issues? And I think the CBC can continue to lead here and hopefully in a more bold um, way where they're communicating that to the outside. Dame, go ahead. The point I wanted to make was the narrative. No matter what uh, we do for each other, there's no one that's going to show that. Fox News isn't going to say the Black Caucus just did something. It's not going to happen. Why would they show our strength? It's for us to have our own so that we could showcase the real heroes. And that's what's being done right now. So again, 
The problem is no matter what we do good, it's going to be strategic for us not to know that we, it's just like, I remember going to an orphanage, an orphan aid in Ghana, and I'm walking around, almost adopted a, 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 a baby. They, we did pictures, no press. But let some, when I go to the orphan aid, there's someone white running it. So in Africa, we're looking like they're saving us. And then there's never a picture. There's always a picture of somebody from another culture saving us. That's what you see. That's what's always put in our face. They're never going to show us helping each other. And there's so many superheroes. As it relates to education, I meet with the OSG network once a week. That's 90 black principals all over the country. I literally do call the congressmen and other people just to see what's going on and how I can help and then make, make them aware of what laws to pass. I remember talking to the congressman, he like, yo, you know what's funny? I'm the dude that really pushed to get everybody that money and Trump put his name on it. And I was tight. I was like, how is that man going to get the credit for that? They're going to take the credit for everything we do, and they always have. That's the pattern, and that's what we need to be fighting, the narrative. Because that's the reason why the same things keep happening. We're born into thinking we're number two. We're born into thinking we need them. We need our own platforms that are bigger than theirs so that we can make our heroes the heroes. Like when I went to the Black Caucus, the only people that got um, applauses were the ones that Donald Trump yelled at. I couldn't believe that. It shouldn't be another white man yelling at us to make us famous. It should be us yelling at them. We have to have our own platforms to promote our patterns. That's the only point I wanted to make. Which, which, I, which is also important, uh, Angela, because when we talk about, you just heard Andre, Andre, Aunt Congressman Andre Carson lay it out. I agree. First of all, I, I, I created my own platform for the very reason, but we also have to have scale. And then when we have the platforms, it's also how we use it. Uh, you know, look, you, you, Congressman Carson mentioned Revolt. The reality is, out of all the Black-owned or targeted networks, Revolt's the only one that launched uh, at least a weekly news show. Since my show got canceled, it was the only No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. I've been having on. He was on my news show, uh, the Congressman. Is it on cable? Is it on cable? Because he said cable news. Does he say cable? Right. I didn't hear cable. I heard you say television network. No, 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 no. I said cable. I, I, was, I, I was very specific but, but because... People, but the thing about it is cable is old. Everybody looks at shit But the it. thing about it is no, 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 he's no, no, making no, a different hold, point. Hold, he's hold not saying second, that it second. shouldn't be digital. Right. He runs hold, a digital hold, show. Hold, hold, hold on one second, one second. Dang, 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 one second. I have a digital show. The point, <laughs> the point I'm making, the point I'm making is, is that I'm talking about scale and capacity. Of the 10 black owned and targeted cable and there's only one one network that is considered broadcast and that's bounce if you want to factor right. that in what, what just i said that i said dang i said black owned and black targeted i'm saying this for a reason what i'm trying to say is of those 10 out of those 10 only one has at least one hour of black news revolt launched their black news show two or three months ago that, so I, I'm agreeing with you, but Angela, what we also have to deal with is we have to be engaged politically because politics also helps us get that scale. If the CBC doesn't push Comcast to create those networks, then Diddy has a much difficult path when it yeah. comes to revolt. And so I want us, our people to be thinking these things are all together. And that is, they all work together, which means we have to be, we have to be uh, clear on the information to how to make these things happen. Yeah, absolutely. I would just give folks one other example. Before BET was owned by Viacom, it was owned by a billionaire named Bob Johnson. Bob and Johnson. She, and Sheila Johnson. Yes, and Sheila Johnson. You're right, Roland. Shout out to Sheila Johnson. But it was Black-owned is my point. And the reason it became a Black-owned network is because Bob Johnson knew the regulatory telecom game. And he figured out how to ensure the political process worked for him and how to maneuver in that political process to get that platform. Whether it be digital or linear, it doesn't matter. That's what it is. But this panel is about hip hop and politics. And so I just wanna go back to the point that it's so important, particularly in an election year, that folks, no matter where their platform is, and we all know how much hip hop has influenced us as individuals and as a culture, 
Let us continue to use the platforms we have, regardless of how small or large, to influence the culture to do the right thing. That is the way that I think we can pay hip hop back. And um, Andre, thank you so much for having this panel every year. Thank all you right. all. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Brother Dame. Thank you, Brother Andre. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Thank you. Appreciate you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. And folks, last point here. Uh, she's doing the work in Kentucky. So that's why Tamika Mallory uh, was not able to join us. We certainly appreciate all the work that she does. Y'all take care. Hopefully we'll see you in person in 2021 at CBCF ALC.